The parasympathetic pupil pathway governs pupil constriction. It has an afferent and an efferent loop. In the afferent loop, light reaching the eye stimulates retinal photoreceptors and intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. These cells generate a signal that travels in retinal ganglion cell axons through the optic nerves, optic chiasm, and both optic tracts, branching off in the brachium of the superior colliculus to synapse in the dorsal midbrain pretectal nuclei on both sides. Axons leave the pretectal nuclei and cross to nuclei on the other side of the dorsal midbrain so that the signal is distributed equally to both parasympathetic Ettinger-Westfall nuclei. Preganglionic axons exiting from the Ettinger-Westfall nuclei carry signals in both third cranial nerves to the ciliary ganglia in both orbits. Postganglionic axons leaving the ciliary ganglia in short ciliary nerves carry the signal to iris sphincters for pupil constriction and to ciliary muscles for accommodation. Unilateral or asymmetric damage to the optic nerves causes an afferent pupil defect, but it does not create anisocoria because the afferent input, however damaged it might be, is equally distributed to the efferent loops supplying both iris sphincters. Damage to retinal ganglion cells or optic nerve axons in both eyes interrupts the afferent signal and reduces or eliminates pupil constriction to light. but pupil constriction to a viewed target placed within reading distance will be preserved because the awareness of a near target stimulates a cerebral pathway that bypasses the afferent loop to connect directly to the Ettinger-Westfall nuclei. This phenomenon is called afferent light near dissociation. Severe unilateral damage to the optic tract causes a contralateral homonymous hemianopia and a contralateral afferent pupil defect because optic chiasm crossing axons outnumber non-crossing axons. Unilateral damage to the brachium of the superior colliculus may cause a contralateral afferent pupil defect without producing a visual field defect. This phenomenon is rare. Damage to the pretectal nuclei in the dorsal midbrain may cause large pupils, anisocoria, and impaired pupil constriction to light in both eyes. Pupils that behave this way are called tectal pupils. If the lesion is restricted to the dorsal midbrain, sparing the tegmental midbrain, the pupils may constrict incompletely to direct light and will constrict more completely to a visual target placed near the eye. This phenomenon is called tectal light near dissociation. It occurs because cerebral signals that drive pupil constriction to a near target are believed to reach the Ettinger-Westfall nucleus through a ventral pathway that bypasses the dorsal midbrain. Damage to the preganglionic segment of the third cranial nerve may affect its parasympathetic efferent pupil loop and cause an ipsilateral medriasis and impairment of pupil constriction to light. Ipsilateral ptosis and ocular ductional deficits will always be present. Damage to the ciliary ganglion or postganglionic axons does not cause ipsilateral ptosis or ocular ductional deficits, but it does cause tonic pupils, and here is an example of a left 80 tonic pupil. This patient has anisocoria. The left pupil is larger than the right pupil. The right pupil constricts normally to direct light. The left pupil is slightly oval and constricts minimally to direct light. It constricts more fully but slowly when the patient views a target at reading distance. It dilates slowly when the patient shifts fixation to a distant target. 
These are features of a tonic pupil caused by a lesion of the ciliary ganglion or ciliary nerves. Here is a patient with a long-standing right tonic pupil. A tonic pupil becomes smaller with age, even smaller than the normal pupil. Is this the sort of pupil that Argyle Robertson described as characteristic of syphilis? Maybe. When it comes to evaluating a patient with anisocoria and one pupil that does not constrict normally to direct light, here's an approach. Make sure that the abnormal pupil is not part of a third nerve palsy, which would be signaled by diplopia, ptosis, and ductional deficits. Once you have excluded a third nerve palsy, the abnormal pupil is going to be caused by a paralyzed, traumatized, or dysplastic iris sphincter. Brain imaging is not necessary and the patient can be reassured.